Good afternoon. It's Thursday, the 28th of January 2016. Mm -hmm. A uh, little bit late today, just after one o'clock. A few technical problems held us up, but here we are, live. Um, well, before we get on to the news, the good, the good news is sunshine, which we've got here in Plymouth. London is pretty good. Bournemouth is looking good. And I think parts of Wales are OK with some cloud. So I think we'll leave it there on the good stuff. Uh, well, first of all, many people have asked us for a report on events around uh, the Bundy Ranch team in America and the Oregon shooting. And uh, we're going to encourage people to go to 21st Century Wire. Patrick Henningsen has put up uh, quite a comprehensive report here. And if you'd like information on this, please do go and uh, read his report. But essentially what is emerging is that no shots were fired by um, any of the militia who were there to uh, support events in Oregon. And it would appear that this uh, gentleman, Lavoy Finnicum, uh, was shot by special agents uh, after he'd got out of his vehicle and uh, was walking with his hands in the air. And this apparently has come from an eyewitness account, an 18-year-old young lady who was travelling in one of the other vehicles. Uh, but uh, it's also reported that um, uh, uh, supporters of the uh, Bundy Ranch team there in Oregon uh, at various points had as many as 20 um, laser sights on them, uh, which indicated that they were being targeted by federal agents. So, Mike, this, this appears to be a, a very, very serious turn of event. And uh, if this report is accurate, I believe it is, uh, then we've now got the situation where American police, we'll call them police for the sake of this, simply have got a shoot to kill policy. We've seen this with with many other uh, American civilians. They've had their hands in, their, in the air. They've been in wheelchairs, uh, a shoot to kill policy. Um, para Paramilitarised police, of course. Paramilitarised, yeah, yeah, of course. And for those who think, well, it, it wouldn't happen here because we don't have the guns. Remember, of course, that uh, David Cameron, Theresa May rapidly uh, promoting the arming of Britain's police. And of course, recently we've had a declaration that, uh, well, we don't want to go prosecuting British policemen who shoot people in the line of their duty. If they pull the trigger, the decision to kill somebody must be correct and uh, we certainly don't want them brought in front of a jury. Dangerous stuff and we'll watch to see how events unfold in America. Well if that is um, the serious news we need to go locally to Plymouth to see the sheer uh, state of Britain's local press and this is what Plymouth's um, Evening Herald thinks is important. It's a piece of artwork, we've featured it before it's uh, called the blob. It is supposed to represent something. This is quite big. I think you've seen it, Mike, haven't you? It's about 15 feet high, um, and it's sitting outside the um, the new college. It's not a college. What is it? It's the uh, School of Creative Arts is what they're calling it. Uh, and uh, it is the most horrible building in Plymouth, I think, is probably. So it's not a great place uh, for learning, in my opinion. It's just been open a year or so. Um, and... Uh, um, the school children that go there basically aren't learning anything. And this is pretty representative, pretty representative of what they are learning. Well, this is exactly it. Well, um, please go and have a look at the Herald's uh, website, see what's going on, because um, they've effectively got acres of space on where has the blob gone. You could not make this up. Um, just outrageous. Um, has the blob gone to Mars? This is not UK column fabricating this. This is uh, the Plymouth Herald. Uh, they go on to suggest maybe it's gone to Parliament. And what is this? This is an attack on people's minds. This is very dangerous. This is, a lot of people will call this stuff ridiculous. It's not ridiculous. This is a dangerous attack on people's minds, particularly the minds of young children. Yeah. So what is going on with the mental health of uh, Plymouth Herald team? Um, I don't, words fail me, no, Mike. Indeed. OK, well, what the Herald isn't reporting is anything to do with uh, um, serious subjects in UK. With tax. Uh, well, um, this is uh, the 
Google corporation tax argument and it's rumbling on. And as Brian has been saying over the last day or two, uh, it should come as no surprise that Google is at the heart of it. Uh, top Tories met Google chiefs 25 times in run-up to sweet ha sweetheart tax deal, uh, so says the Mirror. And of course the story that uh, they wish to present is that this dirty deal was done between b the best of mates, uh, the Tories and the mega corporations in bed with each other doing each other favours, whether they're sexual favours or not I don't know Brian, but they're doing each other favours, it's not specified in the article anyway. Um, Look, this is uh, yet another PSYOP, um, fully facilitated by the press. Um, it says in this article here, fury is mounting, that's the key word there, fury is mounting, that a cushy deal with HM Revenue and Customs will allow Google to pay backdated UK taxes of just £130 million for the last 10 years and a future rate estimated at 3% of its multi-billion pound profits. Uh, and this is uh, their best attempt, the best attempt of the mainstream media to keep people looking in this direction uh, and uh, you know we better get Brussels to investigate it because the EU being the sovereign power on these issues has to be invited to get its or in. Uh, this time they're being invited in by the SNP. Uh, Stuart Hosey MP, uh, Deputy Leader of the Scottish National Party wrote to Margeth Vestager, uh, the EU's antitrust commissioner according to the FT here, uh, urging her to address growing concerns about what he called the opaque deal. Uh, according to a copy of the letter dated January the 27th, which was seen by the FT. Um, but in fact, it's not about some cosy deal between mates. Uh, this is much bigger than that. This is about global governance. Uh, and we've been writing about this for a number of years. I wrote this in two, May 2013. And Patrick Henningsen uh, followed up a couple of days, uh, a couple of weeks later, sorry, um, with this article. Um, the Bilderberg 2013, the co corporation tax agenda was absolutely at the heart of Bilderberg 2013 um, and uh, both these articles highlight that Google also was at the center of the drive for a global corporation tax scheme. Um, we highlighted that global corporation tax was on the agenda as I say for, uh, for Bilderberg that year so it should come as no surprise then and as soon as the issue is brought back to the front and center of corporate news agenda, with Google still right at the fun, uh, forefront of the uh, propaganda, uh, that a backroom deal has been done, taking us another step to that global corporation tax governance. Um, and to quote the uh, OECD here, uh, a, bo a boost to transparency in international tax matters, 31 countries sign up to tax cooperation agreement, uh, enabling automatic sharing of country by country information as part of continuing efforts to boost transparency by multinational enterprises 31 countries signed today the multinational uh, multilateral sorry the multilateral competent authority agreement uh, for the automatic exchange of country by country reports the signing ceremony marks the important milestone uh, milestone sorry towards implementation of the OECD uh, BEPS project BEPS and a significant increase in cross-border cooperation on tax message, uh, matters. Now, the BEPS project provides governments, apparently, with solutions for modernizing international, uh, international ta tax rules. Uh, the BEPS project is a global tax governance regime. Uh, engagement has been extensive, they say, since the beginning of the BEPS project. Over 80 developing countries and other non-OECD, non-G20 economies have participated directly in the technical working groups and shaped the outcomes uh, through regional consultations and thematic global fora, apparently. Uh, national governments therefore become uh, mere administrators for the global tax regime. Um, so if you'd like to learn a bit more about this and the, particularly the drive for uh, one world governance, and you notice I'm saying governance, not government, uh, there is a difference. Uh, we have a series of articles on this subject on the UK Column website. Um, do go and have a look at that as well. Again, in your face, I have to pause, uh, Mike, because uh, as, as always, we're finding it difficult to get this information across because some of it seems to be just so obvious. But um, tax, we've got to have world tax raising powers. We've got to tax people and tax them and tax them again. There is no money, of course, although it's created out of nothing. And there's certainly no money for the NHS. Now, we've been getting a lot of information about the NHS over the past few weeks. And uh, one lady extremely well informed saying that effectively the privatisation of the NHS is virtually complete. It's just not declared. 
virtually complete and the plan is that the moment it is declared uh, you're going to you are only going to see the uh, what they regard as the top private trusts keeping the hospital and keeping the property uh, the other failing sites all of that nhs infrastructure public infrastructure is going to be sold off this is this is what a top insider is telling us um, but information we get um, uh, from our viewers and uh, listeners, often very good, and we were intrigued by this one. Um, they simply pointed us to the Anglo-French Medical Society. We'd never heard of it, so we decided to go and have a look. And um, here it is. Um, it's saying that it's a professional organisation fostering interaction between UK and French doctors and medical students. So it exists, it's got a website, uh, doesn't seem to be that easy to contact or speak to somebody, but it's working in the background uh, to promote integration between French medical students, in particular medical staff and British. Well, what are they getting up to? Well, from their own website, you can see that this is pretty serious stuff, work hard, play hard. Uh, but really, I'm just picking on part of it because this is very smooth sell. Come in with us, party, enjoy the good time, glass of wine and a baguette. And uh, what, what is really going on here, I think, is backdoor integration um, of the NHS into a European health system. Um, the British Association is twinned with this one, which is the French equivalent. In fact, if you look at the detail on this site, you're perhaps led to believe that this is the more important of the two. And um, uh, if you have a look at the detail on here, uh, in the main uh, bureau, the president is a gentleman called uh, Ben Ben Frid, if I've pronounced that correctly. You can look all this up yourself. You don't have to believe what we're saying now. Um, why are we interested in this uh, particular man? Well, we just happened to find that he was the man um, that was used in Bloomberg Business uh, when they had produced this quite in-depth analysis of uh, healthcare in France. It's entitled, obviously, The French Lesson in Healthcare. And um, one of the things they were saying is that the French seem to have it about right, although they're in a lot of debt in their healthcare. Specialists who have spent at least four years practicing in hospital are free to charge what they want. Some charge up of $675 for a single consultation. But American-style compensation is rare. And then here's the quote from our gentleman. There is an unspoken and undefined limit to what you can charge. So clearly this um, partnership with the French is... Uh, is powerful. Bloomberg felt they needed to speak to them about, about healthcare and what's happening. We thought this uh, was backdoor integration. Why did we think that? Well, let's just remind ourselves that it was the Franco-British Council that said it was there just to uh, help promote British-French uh, relationships uh, that was actually holding meetings, sorting out what Britain's future defence needs were going to be. And that's exposed in the uh, article, which you can see on screen from the UK column website. So going back into this uh, medical organisation, we were intrigued to see it was offering the Miss Ford bursaries. And apparently we're led to believe that Miss Ford was a driver um, for um, President de Gaulle uh, during the war. She wanted to help promote French and British uh, relations. And there's some money slushing around which can pay for medical uh, students in Britain to do bursaries in France. So very interesting integration. Um, backdoor, soft sell, get rid of the NHS and slip it sideways into a French system. What do you think, Mike? The French system uh, is pretty much private. You've got to pay for everything ahead of time. And then you've got to claim back whatever your entitlements are afterwards. Um, is that the type of system we want? It's certainly not free at the point of use. Um, it can take a significant time to get your money back afterwards. So it is a completely different system. Um, and uh, uh, the other question is what other types of governance would come in alongside that? Good question. So um, the Guardian is always straight into the mix. Um, here it is, the political spokesperson. 
piece for the government and uh, they've got a debate. How do we pay for the NHS we want? So that uh, question, of course, says it all. We can't pay for the NHS as it is. We're going to change it. What do we want? That doesn't mean what the public wants. That means what the government wants. And here's the good old uh, Guardian driving for that final privatisation. Um, more lies from David Cameron, of course, and this Conservative government. They are intent on privatising the NHS if the public is silly enough to allow them to get away with it. Mm. Um, economic stuff then. Uh, Azerbaijan, a, an oil producing country, along with a number of other oil producing company, countries like uh, Venezuela and so on, uh, absolutely suffering as a result of the oil price situation. And unsurprisingly, perhaps, who should be straight in to try to help them, um, but the IMF and the World Bank. Um, so they're discussing a possible $4 billion emergency loan package uh, to uh, Azerbaijan. Um, and uh, this looks like um, quite a number of mainstream media outlets reporting that they uh, suggest this would be a series of bailouts um, across uh, many of these countries. Um, but of course, uh, there'll be nothing um, positive for these nations because the IMF and the World Bank have a long-standing history of treating uh, countries that they lend money to very well, don't they? <laughs> yes, anyway, uh, possibly more interestingly, George Soros is, uh, has popped his head up because he was at Davos last week uh, and he was speaking uh, to Bloomberg News, among others, uh, and he said, uh, we are repeating, and he was referring to 2008, uh, and, of course, he went on to blame China for the uh, economic and financial woes. And he said, it's serious, and the Chinese left it too long to address the changeover in, in the growth model that they have to adopt from. They have to adopt from investment and export-led to domestic-led. So a hard landing is practically unavoidable. Uh, needless to say, what is he doing in the meantime? He is busy uh, short-selling the, uh, the uh, Chinese currencies. Uh, and uh, he's attempting to bring China down. So if China is causing the global uh, economic and financial problems, which of course is what the mainstream press is telling us, well, George Soros personally is causing many of the problems for China. So, uh, you know, you can take out of that as you will. Nonetheless, the Chinese uh, are taking a slightly different uh, approach to this. They're basically laughing at uh, George Soros and saying, you know, what, what do you think you can do to us? Um, this is the People's Daily, uh, and they've got a couple of articles on this. Uh, they're saying that uh, Soros' war on the renminbi and the Hong Kong dollar cannot possibly succeed. Uh, about this, there can be no doubt. Uh, they call him a financial crocodile. They blame him for uh, increasing volatility in already unstable financial markets. Uh, and uh, they say that uh, Soros' war on Asian currencies will help China deepen fiscal and financial cooperation, whether in East Asia or along the Belt and Road. And of course, this is the, the point. China is investing in so much infrastructure, physical, productive infrastructure around the world. They don't really, um, they're not really too concerned about what Soros is up to. But nonetheless, he is, play, he is the man that's playing the games with the Chinese currency. And uh, that, of course, is having the knock-on effect on the Chinese stock market. And if you believe what the mainstream media says, which we don't, that's what's causing the problems in the West. Um, this, this is very interesting, Mike, because, of course, Soros happens to be the same man who's funding into the Wolf Institute, uh, which is producing the reports supported by the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is attacking Christianity in Britain. So remarkable man. He's working with his banker friends and he's also apparently working with the Archbishop of Canterbury. His hands are in everything. Um, in the meantime, in Spain, uh, Another bail-in looks like likely pretty seriously, uh, pr pretty uh, shortly. Sorry, uh, this is uh, as a result of the uh, decision by the Spanish Supreme Court uh, to force Bankia um, to pay out uh, huge amounts of money um, as a result of mis-selling of uh, what we might call complex financial instruments to to the general public. Um, they were Bankia was accused of uh, serious inaccuracies in uh, their advertising program when they launched these products uh, and uh, it looks like thousands of customers uh, are going to be in line for compensation. Uh, now, of course, if they have the same success that people have been receiving uh, uh, PPI insurance claims, money have been 
you know, it may not, it may take a little longer than 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 people think, but nonetheless, uh, Bankia is uh, believed to have set aside 1.9 billion euros uh, to cover uh, payouts, um, but it's looking like they um, aren't going to be able to cover that, and a bail-in is is quite likely. So, Spanish banks once again right at the centre of the collapse. Santander. Can possibly mention Santander. Can we? Okay. Well, one of the things that uh, UK columns um, constantly been saying is, of course, a lot of the policy coming in is being done by stealth. It's being done a bit at a time. Yesterday, uh, we put up part of a Twitter that was mocking David Cameron with a, um, a reference to Hitler bringing in policies a piece at a time. Now, somebody's picked us up for this and said, "Well, this wasn't a real quote." Um, I, I meant to bring up the image, so it was a Twitter, uh, it was taken from a Twitter page, um, and uh, the person here is saying that this wasn't a real quote and it also wasn't in Mein Kampf. Now, we're putting this up because it's okay, the criticism is fair, but we're going to put a but in, and the but is, this doesn't change the fact that, incre that incremental change was used to bring in the Nazi regime, and eyewitnesses have told us personally um, about their experiences in uh, pre-war Germany, and they describe the change in the system and the state as coming in uh, like the drip, drip, drip of an anaesthetic. Uh, so we are going to say, we take your point. However, the real message is that we are warning and warning that a lot of the major change being brought in is being drifted in a little bit at a time so that people are not reacting quickly or they forget the first change and we move on. However, we did get another comment and this one uh, t comes in from the other direction. It says, thank you for today's show. It's always a pleasure listening to Alex Thompson. The quote by Hitler of the small changes in the law reminds me of Herschel Sperling in the book Treblinka about the invasion of Poland when he was a 15 year old. The first thing the law was changed to forbid Jews from using tin utensils for cooking. These slight changes uh, that are there to cause problems just remind me of Jefferson's quote, when injustice becomes law, resistance becomes duty. So we're going to say to our viewers and listeners, and the big picture is the important thing at the moment. We've got a dictatorship coming in by stealth. It's using subversion. It's using propaganda. And we've got to recognize that these small changes can be equally as dangerous as the big changes. Mike. Right. Uh, Russia. Sergei Lavrov, a couple of days ago, um, during a press conference, uh, suggested that uh, he has evidence that Islamic State is operating in Georgia, in uh, the uh, Pankisi uh, Gorge, sorry. Uh, we're getting reports, he said, that IS militants use this remote area to train, rest and replenish the reserves. Uh, and he said that it hadn't been possible uh, to open the borders since a visa regime was introduced between Russia and Georgia in 2000. And that that was uh, because of the terrorist threat coming, sorry, because of the terrorist threat coming from the Pankisi uh, Gorge had not faded. So um, unsurprisingly, the Georgian government denies this. Uh, in, regard to, in regard to the Pankisi Gorge, Minister Lavrov made a, a tendentious statement as Georgian authorities fully control this region, according to the Prime Minister of Georgia. Uh, and uh, well, I can have to say, Brian, I can see what's coming here. Russia will be presented once again as an aggressor. Uh, the West will claim that Russia has unfinished business in Georgia following the South Ossetian War in 2008, uh, where it was uh, George Soros stooge Michael Saakashvili, Mikhail Saakashvili, who was uh, in fact the aggressor at that point. Um, I would uh, have thought that if there are IS fighters training in Georgia, um, then uh, they've been placed there uh, for the specific purpose of drawing Russia into a further conflict of, uh, with Georgia. And uh, yeah, have you got any views? Well, I mean, it's... It's just becoming so obvious, isn't it, that uh, Putin is the ob absolute aggressor. He started all the wars and uh, we've got to motivate NATO and the world in order to counter him. Well, indeed, that is exactly, exactly the uh, point of view being put forward by the United States European Command. Uh, and here's the document and here's the quote. Russia is presenting enduring challenges to our allies and partners in multiple regions. Therefore, it is a global challenge that requires a global response. 
uh, they went on. They go on to say in this uh, in this strategy document, reduced U.S. forward presence and degraded readiness across the services are inhibiting the United States' ability to favorably reshape the environment. Is that the U.S. role? Uh, well, I think it's the U.S. role to reshape the world, Mike. Looks um, like it. Uh, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> starting off in Oregon, it would appear. Well, indeed. Uh, US EUCOM cannot fully mitigate the impact felt from a reduction in assigned military forces through the augmentation of rotational forces from the United States. The temporary presence of rotational forces complements but does not substitute for an enduring forward deployed presence in, that is tangible and real. So, what that says to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that. Uh, the United States European Command is basically demanding that more troops are stationed per permanently in Europe uh, to counter this threat that they claim is coming from uh, Russia. Yeah. Extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. Um, some comment in our chat box where people are effectively talking about um, the situation um, becoming complicated so that the government says, well, it's much too complicated for you you little people to understand what's going on. You trust us for your security. And that's the impression I get from the mainstream media reports at the moment. We've got Daesh, we've got ISIS, we've got Al Nusra, we've got those naughty Russians. Much too difficult for the general public in UK to understand. You leave it to me, David Cameron, trust me. Mm. Not. Okay, and this is uh, another aspect of, uh, of the thing. Um, I was talking uh, to Mother uh, Agnes about this on Tuesday, um, but the British government now, according to The Guardian, has done a U-turn over the resettlement of Syrian children. So David Cameron, during Prime Minister's questions, has basically said that that wasn't going to happen, and then within a couple of minutes, uh, the Home Office had uh, changed their minds. And they. I'll just read a little of what The Guardian says here. The Home Office announces that it will take vulnerable minors already in Europe following calls from politicians and charities. Britain will take some unaccompanied Syrian refugee children who are already in Europe. The government is to announce and it will set aside a new £10 million fund to support migrant children. Now, who's been uh, pushing for this? Well, Save the Children and also the Liberal Democrat leader Tim Farron uh, and the for former Shadow uh, Home Secretary Yvette Cooper have all been pushing for this and they're wanting 26,000 unaccompanied children in Europe. And um, now, Farron has welcomed this uh, measure, apparently, and he has said that Britain has always been a compassionate and welcoming country, and I'm delighted that the government has finally, after months of pressure, committed to vital humanitarian aid. Um, but something else that the Guardian article points out is that as many as 1,000 unaccompanied child refugees uh, disappeared in, in Italy during 2015. Um, so I'm going to say to everybody that's uh, watching and listening to this program today, I would like everybody to write a letter to Tim Farron. And since he was so uh, such a part of uh, bringing these children into Britain, and bearing in mind Britain's uh, record for children disappearing out of Britain's care system, I would like everybody to write to Tim Farron and basically put him on notice um, and make him responsible for the safety of any child that comes into this country unaccompanied from Syria. So they are saying that they want to do this because of the danger of child trafficking uh, with these unaccompanied children. There is a danger that they'll come to Britain and will end up being trafficked in Britain. Um, Tim Farron needs to be made responsible for their safekeeping and well-being. Well, um, um, Mike, I've got to say, I think that's a really good idea. These people are just unbelievable hypocrites because here is this man saying, come to Britain, we're going to look after all these children when we're not looking after our own children. And what did Tim Farron do really for Holly Gregg or Melanie Shaw when people went to Tim Farron asking for help? Did they get any tangible help? No. Now he's leader. He's got a bandwagon. He's using He's using the children to uh, improve his political position. Yeah. They're disgusting. just disgusting yeah. people. <laughs> but by all means, communicate because uh, it does put the pressure on. Well, we'd just like here to um, show you what happens when it's not us doing the work. It's, uh, it's you doing the work. It's our viewers and listeners. And... Um, uh, it'd be interesting if um, if some of the people in the chat room had actually uh, been involved in this research. I don't know whether they were, uh, but we got this little um, email, and what it says, 
is who owns or runs this organisation, the future of education in the UK, a common purpose allied organisation. A friend of mine has been asked to fill in a questionnaire, a, a midday dinner supervisor, not a teacher. And it's headed Mindset Intervention Initial Staff Survey, Osiris Educational. So it was a little bit of a, a copy, and um, this was the bit that we picked up on. So we decided to follow it through. Who was this organisation starting to do questionnaires in schools? Well, here they are, Osiris Educational, UK's leading independent training provider for teachers. They're boasting that they've trained 30,000 teachers. And we thought, well, what, what exactly are they about? Now, there's a lot of leadership in this. I'll say future leadership. And I, I smelt that what we'd also got is NLP uh, here. So you can have a look at one of their conferences, Building Character Conference 2016. Who's involved? Well, here's one of the key uh, men, uh, Professor Guy Claxton. Uh, is the UK's leading authority on developing pupils' learning and cr creative capacities. Notice the creative, Mike. Who says this man is the UK's leading authority? Well, well he does. Was, uh, well, the organisation does. He, he clearly thinks so. From what I've seen, unbelievably arrogant. His Building Learning Power programme helps students become better learners in school and out. Well, if you have any concerns about this man... Um, let's have a look at this one here. I uh, don't know whether you can see it. Let's bring it on screen. Richard Forte from McDonald's. Richard is the chief operating officer at McDonald's who has commissioned a report calling for soft skills to be embedded into the school curriculum. What do you think that means, Mike? I'm sure that would mean that any uh, educational materials be heavily branded. Uh, in order to create suitable workers for McDonald's? Quite possibly shelf stackers or coffee pourers uh, well here's the man let's make sure we know who it is here, here he is you can go on the mcdonald's site and we're saying would you value his opinion in relation to your child's education personally i never uh, let my children go into mcdonald's or very very rarely i was obviously a bad parent but i don't believe in the quality of mcdonald's food um, why is this man now helping to train Britain's teachers? What has he got to add? Um, nothing. We don't, nothing. So let's come back to the professor. You need to watch these videos to see the arrogance of this man, the idea of building learning power. He says we can make children smarter. And I've had to put in there, so presumably our children can work in McDonald's. And um, who are they? Why are we silly enough to let these people near our children? The answer is because we don't realise these people are close to our children and we need to uh, get in amongst it. So have a look at the professor yourself. He's connected with Bristol University and he's involved in everything. Um, he's involved in the mind, unconscious mental processes, incubation and creativity, emotions, neuroscience. Oh, and he says spirituality and education. Well, if you want to know about his uh, spirituality, you can watch another talk he did on being touched and moved, why spirituality is really about the body. So he gives a quasi-scientific um, talk, which actually proves nothing, uh, but he declares himself to be an intellectual. And uh, interestingly enough, he refers back to this organisation, the Alastair Hardy Religious Experience Research Centre, and if you want to have a look at who's involved at that, we've got everybody. Um, it appears, and also this gentleman, Jonathan Porritt, taking yes. us to the brave new world. Indeed. So there we are. Uh, thank you very much for the person who flagged it up. What we'd like to say is it's up to our viewers and listeners to get those emails and tweets out there exposing these organisations for what they're doing. Uh, it requires action, not just discussion. Saw this this morning, Brian. So Jeremy Haywood, head of the civil service. Excellent news to see the UK return to the top 10 in the Transparency, Corruption, uh, Transparency UK Corruption Perceptions Index. Now, I wasn't clear at first glance whether this meant that the UK had returned to the top 10 of the most corrupt countries in the world. Well, or, I think that uh, would be the case. Uh, 
That's, <laughs> you may say that. Uh, so uh, I had to have a, go and have a look. So here is Transparency International UK. Uh, and they say, uh, time for serious action by the UK on corruption. An improvement of four places from 14th to 10th in the Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index is an opportunity for the UK to lead on global corruption at the Prime Minister's forthcoming anti-corruption summit in May. So David Cameron, one of the most corrupt prime ministers we've ever had, in my opinion, uh, is holding an anti-corruption summit in May. So that's great. We'll keep an eye out for that one. Well, they'll be they'll be learning new techniques to cover up corruption, Mike. I'm sure it'll be a very worthwhile um, um, conference. Well, indeed. So Transparency International has warned that to be a world leader in anti-corruption efforts, the UK must also ensure its own house is in order. Measures should include strengthening the UK's anti-money laundering defences, cleaning up British politics, it's going to be a pretty hard job. Improving transparency, introduce transparency over beneficial ownership of uh, companies and property, both in the UK and its overseas transparencies, and strengthen the Freedom of Information Act. Well, that's a bit unfortunate because, of course, the government has set up its independent, and in inverted commas, panel of five people to uh, reduce the uh, uh, scope of the Freedom of Information Act. Well, I'll be fair, Mike, because... Um um, Mr. Straw is uh, one of the big players in that, of course, the man who wanted to make it difficult for children to speak out if they were being abused. So yeah. they've got quality of people. Uh, absolutely. And the final one here is effective law enforcement. Ensure that the Serious Fraud Office has sufficient resources to do the job. Now, of course, the problem about fraud investigations uh, in this country is that uh, the Serious Fraud Office only looks at um, fraud, which is uh, over a million pounds. So... When the bank steals your house, which is worth 150, 250, 350 thousand pounds, the serious fraud office isn't, isn't going to look at that. Um, so don't worry. Um, but anyway, Transparency International calling for more transparency from the British government. Uh, British government, apparently, Britain back in the top 10 of uh, the most corrupt nations. Yes. Um, we, we just say, um, what better case on, on, uh, as an example of that than the Tom Crawford case where we, we have got fraud being committed uh, by banks in relation to mortgages, that fraud perpetuated through court cases, documents simply not produced, don't exist, no investigation. And we know of other cases where people have reported serious fraud, fraud multi-million pound fraud locally, and that has resulted in them being harassed and threatened by their local police. In fact, I'll go further than that, and I will say by Devon and Cornwall police. So we've, we've got a state system which covers up uh, fraud and corruption. And of course, until we deal with that, um, the situation is going to get worse. Well, we're going to end on the subject of music, and I found this a fascinating bit of information. People can make of it what they will. Uh, but somebody sent us in this uh, website and this particular article, The Secret Meeting That Changed Rap Music and Destroyed a Generation. Um, now, I read this against the backdrop of all the other activities we're seeing where the public is being attacked by propaganda and uh, dangerous um, artwork, for example. I encourage you to go and read this article, uh, which is anonymous but it's the content. And in the content, when they're talking about the music industry, a person is saying that they were called to an exclusive meeting at which a man who only introduced himself by his Christian name said, he explained that the companies we work for in the music industry had invested millions into the building of privately owned prisons and that our positions of influence in the music industry would actually impact on the profitability of these investments. What it went on to say was that if hip-hop could be uh, pushed through, um, the crime rate would go up, hence the profits would go up. Uh, I encourage you to go and read it, see what that person had to say, use your own judgment on whether you think this is some sort of fantasy, or whether something very, very dark and sinister was being organised to attack our children. OK, that's it from us today. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back at one o'clock tomorrow um, with um, David Scott and Northern Exposure. 
And I think one of the subjects that David will be mentioning is the fact we believe there is a secret uh, slush fund which allows um, serving members of the government to defend themselves against allegations of corruption or uh, um, misdemeanors in public office, but they can use public money for their defence. Um, so that is going to be extremely interesting to hear about that slush fund and the policy. Okay, we'll be back one o'clock tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.